During World War II, Japanese troops under the command of the imperial family and the legendary General Yamashita are said to have buried a fortune in treasure in the Philippines. The story goes that it was looted during the Japanese march across Asia. Some say it was the largest hoard in history. The quantities that people talk about over here, I mean, are mind-boggling. You're talking not tons, but hundreds of tons of gold. You're chasing something that's a, that's a real dream. There's romance, adventure, excitement, and it allows grown men to be little boys again. Rumors of a vast treasure left by the Japanese began to sweep the Philippines shortly after the war. The rumors have never died away. Books and internet websites have helped to spread the story of Yamashita's gold. Its most dramatic version claims that during the war, the Japanese imperial family masterminded an operation to loot the territories the Japanese had conquered, and that towards the end of the war, they buried hundreds of tons of stolen gold in sites throughout the Philippines. Sterling Seagrave, an American author, has spent a couple of decades investigating Yamashita's gold. We know that there were 175 imperial treasure sites, and these sites have marked on them the quantity of gold that was hidden in each vault. They had hidden $100 billion, 1945 dollars worth of treasure in the Philippines. Like many Filipinos, Marcos was also fascinated by legends of Yamashita's gold. In the late 60s, rumors began to circulate that Marcos had found the treasure, rumors that Marcos himself encouraged. Well, Marcos started out with less than $60,000 in assets according to his tax returns when he took over as president in 1966. In 1970, it became apparent he was making a lot more money than his presidential salary. And he called in the local press and said, do you know how I made my pile, boys? I found the treasure of Yamashita. Marcos claimed that he'd first got hold of maps to the Yamashita treasure as a guerrilla fighting the Japanese in the northern Philippines. Few believed him later on when he and his wife Imelda said that he'd actually found Yamashita's gold. But in 1971 came a discovery that indelibly linked Marcos's name with Yamashita's gold and appeared to provide concrete proof of the existence of the treasure itself. They found a golden Buddha at three feet. The, high, the height is three feet and uh, the weight is one ton. Henry's father, Rogelio Rojas, a Filipino locksmith and treasure hunter, claimed to have found a solid gold Buddha in a tunnel behind a hospital in the former Japanese stronghold of Baggio. He believed the Buddha was part of Yamashita's private hoard. For a quarter of a century, treasure hunters had been searching for the gold. Now, here was a startling piece of evidence for the authenticity of the Yamashita's gold story. Rojas said that he'd been given a map by a former Japanese officer which showed the whereabouts of the Buddha. We know there's Buddha there because of the map, but to locate the entrance is really very hard. It took us 17 days because it is already blasted. So that is how we entered the body. We found the entrance of the tunnel. And you can remove the head of the golden Buddha, and there is a uh, diamond inside, more or less two cups of diamond, a big diamond. 25 years after these photographs were taken, an American court awarded one of the largest judgments in legal history to the Rojas family against the heirs of the dictator Marcos, $22 billion. As Rojas told it, shortly after he discovered the Buddha, agents of Marcos raided his home and confiscated it. 
a media outcry ensued. Two weeks later, the Buddha was returned. After nine days, when they raided the house, they surrendered, the, uh, the military raided her house. They surrendered the Buddha at the Baguio City Hall, but it's fake, a fake Buddha. Rojas alleged a switch. This Buddha was made of bronze and its head did not detach. Rojas was arrested. Under duress, he retracted his protest. It was only 20 years later, after Marcos's fall from power, that Rojas felt safe enough to pursue the former president in court. He claimed Marcos still had the original gold Buddha and sued him for its return. Despite the doubts and rumors, Rojas always maintained that his Buddha was made of gold and that Marcos stole it. Just before Rojas was due to fly to Hawaii to give evidence against Marcos, he died. His friends and family claim he was murdered, poisoned by Marcos. But the Rojas case was about to take a dramatic twist. A witness was produced who claimed he'd seen a Buddha identical to Rojas's in Marcos's now abandoned summer palace in the Philippines. A witness who helped swing the trial the Rojas's way. And who may be the key to the truth about Yamashita's gold. The Golden Buddha case, brought by Rogelio Rojas against the Marcoses in the American courts, revealed a web of intrigue in the Philippines. Rojas's lawyers had to prove that the Buddha found by their client was made of gold, and that former Philippines President Ferdinand Marcos stole it. As part of their case, they brought forward a treasure hunter named Robert Curtis. If you want to get to the truth about Yamashita's gold, you're going to come across the name of Curtis, an ex-auto salesman who started working in the precious metals business in the 1970s. Curtis's story is that in 1975, he saw a golden Buddha at Marcos's now abandoned summer palace a claim he repeated under oath to lawyers for Rojas. While you were there at the uh, Summer Palace, did you see any gold? Yes. Uh, where, in what form was the gold? <clears throat> well, one was a Buddha and the other were bars. And where did you see a Buddha? In his office. That photograph contains a picture of two people and a picture of a Buddha with some rope around it. Uh, do you recognize the Buddha in that photograph? That's the Buddha that I saw on the floor of the Summer Palace. There's no question there could only be one Buddha like that. Curtis's testimony supported other evidence in the case for the Rojases. And in August of 1996, a court in Hawaii awarded Rojas's heirs one of the biggest damages judgments in legal history. $22 billion. In the trial, busily occupied recovering billions, hundreds perhaps, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of gold, and they knew that there were a great many more sites yet to be uncovered after that. So it's self-evident that the reason to get rid of Yamashita was to get rid of the man who would know that you had done this. Marcos was a villain. The list of people he harmed is a long one. Another who says he's owed money by the Marcos family is Robert Curtis. He says that Marcos had acquired a fortune in gold and that the dictator hired him to find more. During this meeting with the president, uh, he was trying to eliminate any doubts that I had. So um, the purpose of the trip was to show me gold. 
he asked General Bear to take me downstairs and show me some uh, gold that was recovered from one of his sites. Well, there was a hallway and uh, some guards at a door, um, which they opened up and I went in. And uh, there were gold stacked from floor to ceiling. I was amazed that they could get that much gold stacked up that high. Curtis says that Marcos and the treasure hunters had acquired maps to 172 Japanese burial sites. The story of where these maps came from and how Marcos's group acquired them is a romantic one. The version offered by Curtis and others is that the maps were left with a Filipino, Ben Valmores, at the end of the war. According to this story, Valmores had served as valet to the Japanese officer responsible for the treasure burials, Prince Takeda. Valmores is the key eyewitness. Uh, he visited the treasure sites. He went with his prince during the excavation, uh, during the loading of the treasure into the vaults, and then during the final inventories before the vaults were sealed. Toward the end of the war, uh, he went with Prince Takeda up to the northern end where they rendezvoused with a Japanese submarine and it was arranged for Prince Takeda to be smuggled out of uh, the Philippines to Japan. He turned to Ben and he left his satchel full of original treasure maps with Ben, figuring that if the submarine were sunk on its way back to Japan, Ben would ob obligate himself to turn the satchel over to Takeda's family after the war. Marcos, he says, learnt of the existence of the maps. He dispatched one of his top treasure hunters, a Colonel Villacrucis, to get hold of them. Colonel Villacrucis see the map because he's the one who break the lock. And he says to me, Ben, this is a map of treasure. So I was surprised when he says that, that uh, that is a map of treasure. So, no, might be, I don't know. The Labour Group was the name of Marcos's treasure hunting team. It included Villacrucis and Valmores. Robert Curtis says that he was asked to join the group. His tasks, to decode the Japanese maps and to find the gold. Then, he says, he had to use his metallurgical knowledge to re-smelt the gold so that its origins were disguised. Curtis uh, was a success. He reverse-engineered about eight sites, and one of them, the most celebrated, was called Teresa. Teresa II, actually, because there are four different Teresa sites on the same odd-shaped Sugarloaf Mountain. Curtis says that the Teresa site was selected as the first test of his engineering skills. Beneath it lay an underground complex built by slave labor. The Valmores maps indicated it held army trucks filled with bullion, solid gold Buddhas and precious gems. 60 feet down, Curtis claims they hit a Japanese booby trap. Curtis says Marcos's troops cleared the site as a safety measure, but he was never allowed to return. Shortly after, he says he was forced to leave the Philippines in fear of his life. On July 5th, 1975, uh, uh, Colonel Lachica picked me up to take me to see General there and President Marcos, but instead took me to the um, U.S. military uh, cemetery in Fort Bonifacio, where I was led to a group of rhododendron bushes, and I saw this hole in the ground, big enough to sit my body in, and uh, Colonel Chicka put a 45 behind my ear and told me, we're good friends, but I'm sorry I have to do this. Obviously, you're still here, so I assume the gun was not fired. Well, I'm a good talker. <laughs> Were you able to talk your way out of it? Yes. And Amazingly, uh, I did. 
Did you then decide it was time to leave the Philippines? Wouldn't you? Yes. At that point, Marcos came in with his soldiers, and they removed only the gold that they found in the back of eight or nine army trucks that were in one of the tunnels. The amount of gold Marcos recovered was $9 billion worth of gold. In 1975 values, after that, gold prices went way up. Back in the US, Curtis went public with his story. It was embarrassing for the Marcos regime and excited huge interest among treasure hunters. Curtis claimed to have photographed and then burned the original treasure maps before leaving the Philippines. He was now the key source of information about the supposed 172 sites. Few questions. But in April 1996, a Japanese documentary crew caught on tape a cave full of gold bars said to be worth over $150 million. For many, this was incontrovertible proof of the existence of the Yamashita treasure. I'd made several programs about the Philippines since 1987, and all throughout that time, I thought I'd like to do a program about the Yamashita treasure. Then, in the winter of 1995, someone brought me a videotape. I had a look at it and saw that it contained footage of several hundred gold bars in the jungle in the Philippines. As a result of that, I really wanted to get some film of it for myself. Until I saw the gold actually in front of me, I really didn't think it existed. But suddenly it was there, right in front of my eyes. My first reaction was, this is amazing. The documentary crew were given samples from one of the gold bars, which they took back to Tokyo for testing. The tests proved it was high-grade gold. My, my pleasure, really. Excellent. Now, why don't we begin tell, you know, talking a little bit about yourself here in the beginning. You, you have a long career writing many books yourself with uh, your wife, of course, Peggy, who unfortunately couldn't join us here today. But just tell us a little bit about um, how, how you two got together, started writing, and, and a little bit later here we're going to get into some of the, uh, specifically some of the topics, of course. But just give us a little primer here, if you will. Well, uh, both of us started out um, born in, in the United States, um, but um, my family had been living for a couple of hundred years uh, as missionaries, medical missionaries out in Burma. So uh, the U.S. was always uh, a little bit strange and alien to me. I, I joined uh, Time Life Books where I met Peggy. I was uh, a senior writer there and she was um, a senior picture editor and researcher. So we began working on books together and did quite a few, 20 some, um, and eventually um, decided to get married. So it worked out well in the sense that um, uh, she working as uh, essentially researcher and editor in the beginning uh, and me as a writer um, made a good team, and especially when I discovered that she was able to uh, find out things when she went out on a research trip that nobody else could. There uh, was a famous episode in the Boxer Rebellion in China back in 1900, where the British correspondent, the most famous correspondent there, was uh, George Morrison from Australia. And um, when he died, he left his papers to the Mitchell Library in Sydney. 
Peggy went down there to have a look through his papers and discovered that um, he had written two versions of the Boxer Rebellion, one for the British paper where he wanted to make the Brits look good, and the other was a private diary that apparently nobody else had bothered to read very thoroughly. Peggy read through it and found that it denied, it said the opposite of what he had been saying in the newspaper. Hmm. So it turns out that uh, he was pocketing things while they were busy looting, uh, while the allied forces were busy uh, liberating the legation quarter. And uh, everybody was looting and Morrison joined in. So she, uh, she had this knack for discovering uh, stuff that was just astounding. And uh, it worked better and better and we got um, a lot of, of um, pleasure out of collaborating on the text as well. So she began writing uh, chapters for the different books and it ended up being a good collaboration. We've written about 10 or 11 books now, nonfiction. And um, these are all biographies or, or they're basically investigative books, mostly uh, investigating the bad behavior of some of the richest uh, and most powerful families in Asia, um, like Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek's wife's family and um, the Japanese imperial family, where they've often written about the men in the family, but nobody's ever written about the women before. Hmm. So we did a book on... Um, the Japanese imperial family in which both the women and the men uh, are covered. And we discovered in the course of this, Peggy discovered, that uh, Hirohito's mother was a Christian. She was a, a Quaker. And so for that matter, were several of her sons. I don't know about Hirohito for sure. But when they had their various funerals, they had to have one public funeral that was um, Shinto and another private funeral for the family, which was uh, Christian. So this is the kind of thing that she would come up with as she went to work on various books. So it, it turned out to be uh, just a, a really hell of a good collaboration for us. Plus she has tremendous energy. In any case, we've, we've concentrated on, on the really evil deeds, the, uh, the underworld uh, side of these extremely famous and um, I won't say notorious because we're talking about Madame Chiang Kai-shek and she was considered voted in the United States as uh, one of the 10 greatest women on earth, one of the 10 most admired. So... Mm -hmm. How did they get away with with this? Well, they spent an awful lot of money on publicity and creating false images of themselves while they were busy uh, siphoning off, looting, or extorting millions, in fact, billions of dollars. So it's been great fun for us. We've had a bunch of death threats and we hid out for a year off the west coast of, of Canada. And, uh, you know, just disappeared off the face of the earth for a while and kept a, a shotgun nearby. Hmm. Uh, and the guys who came looking to kill me or us uh, couldn't find us. So they went down to San Francisco and they murdered a Chinese journalist named Henry Liu. But, uh, you know. This is, is fun in a sense for me. It's it's exciting. It make it's much more exciting than sitting in a in a newspaper. I used to work for the Washington Post and there would be some exciting assignments or a, a chance to cover for somebody else at the White House. But uh, it just isn't the same thing because you basically do what you're told, whereas if you're a freelance writer, um, you you have to um, you have to do it yourself. Indeed, and and uh, we're going to get into some of the reasons here, uh, of course, why uh, someone might want to go after uh, you and some of the details of this is things that 
is contained within your work, within the books. And you have, well, I mean, your your whole focus, as far as I have understand it, your your lineup, what you have in terms of uh, books is focused on, on the Far East. Uh, primarily, you have one, I think, that is about... Uh, uh, the uh, yellow rain basically on you know soviet uh, developed and uh, distributed by bio- biochemical weapon but majority is, is about japan the far east the philippines that we'll get into uh, later was this now then a, a a choice or was it just that it happened to be in this area where there was a lot of undiscovered um, uh, material i guess uh, sterling just happened that way um in the case of uh, yellow rain that was actually primarily about uh, Laos, because at that time uh, the U.S. was pulling out of its secret war in Laos, but there were still um, a lot of collusion going on uh, against the uh, communist Patet Lao. And uh, the Hmong people who were being um, on the U.S. side at that point uh, were a lot of them were dying of internal bleeding, massive hemorrhaging and so forth, and nobody could figure out what was causing it. And they figured it had to be some kind of chemical weapon, but they didn't know what. So I got intrigued in this because I like Laos, and my my family have been in Burma for a couple of hundred years as missionaries, medical missionaries. So I, I have an affection for the Laotian people and wanted to find out what the poison was. So I went out to Laos and had a look around, interviewed a lot of Laotians, talked to some American doctors who were specialists in severe burns and other damage to the skin and internal organs. And eventually I worked my way through all the books, all the encyclopedias of poisons until I came to the same group that penicillin belongs to, uh, you know, uh, uh, a fungus, a fungal poison. Mm-hmm. And this was called trichothecine. In fact, I found one that so perfectly nailed on the head what was happening in Laos that I actually got it down to trichothecine. And a friend of mine who was... Um, a uh, military attaché out there came back and stayed at my house over the weekend and complained to me that he had sent back so many samples from the, the uh, thatch roofs. Why couldn't the people out at Fort Detrick, the specialists in chemical weapons, figure out what the poison was? And he's, I, I think he concluded that they just looked at whether it was nerve agent or phosgene or something like that. So I I called a friend of mine who was the chief forensic pathologist at the CIA, and I asked him to come over and have coffee with us. We talked it over, and I asked him if he couldn't have the people at Fort Detrick um, take these samples out and test them again, but this time test them for trichocephine 3. And he actually did it, and they found it all over the place. And in fact, they found it in in Canada, in Norway, in Holland, and so forth. Hmm. So that that gave me um, a whopping big thing to be interviewed about. (laughs) I found myself getting interviewed by just about everybody, but the book wasn't in the bookstores yet. It had all happened so fast. Hmm. In any case, the book made me famous, if not rich, and so that got me... um, an invitation to do a book about Madame Chiang Kai-shek's family called uh, the Song Dynasty. And uh, Peggy helped me a great deal on that because she has a very clear eye for editing as well as for research. And the book became a bestseller all over the United States. And Madame Chiang did something very stupid. As you know, you can tell I, I don't have a very high opinion, didn't have a very high opinion of her. Mm. Um, but she got a hold of her her cohort in Taiwan and, and had them 
drum up three full page ads, one for the New York Times, one for the Washington Post and one for the L.A. Times. And this cost her 86,000 per page. So it was pretty good promotion for me. And the next day, the book was a bestseller. It was denouncing me for deliberately misinterpreting Chinese history when all I was doing was telling the truth behind her family. There's fact, uh, no such thing as bad publicity then, I guess, huh? Yeah, good publicity. <laughs> yep. Her name wasn't even um, uh, Song. The name of the family was originally Han. Hmm. And when her father ran away from home and went off to the United States. The Americans had hardly ever seen at that time in the late 1900s, uh, had they ever seen a Chinese, unless you were on the West Coast where they were building the railways. But they misunderstood his name and, and used it backwards. So his, his name Han was forgotten completely. That's his family name. And instead they called him by what would be for us our first name. So he became Charlie Sung. Uh, wasn't his name at all. Hmm. So she became Mei Ling Sung and her sisters, the other Sung, three Sung sisters who are so famous, um, also uh, were, were called uh, Sung. And, you know, it was just strange, bizarre things like that would, would pop up. You would discover that it wasn't the person that you thought it was. Uh, the, the, there was no such thing as a boxer rebellion. There weren't any boxers in Peking when the boxer rebellion was supposed to have happened. It was all made up by uh, by George Morrison. And, you know, it's George Morrison whose son is the love interest in Love is a Money Splendored Thing, the movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The guy who dies in Korea covering the Korean War. So there are lots of things that make it very exciting to work on a book like this. You're You're looking at very famous families like the Japanese imperial family, uh, the Marcos, is, um, and you're getting into what they're really doing behind the false front. The false front being, oh, gee, we're just here to try to make this a Christian democracy. All the stuff you hear now about the Middle East is what you used to hear about the Far East during the last Far Eastern crisis, which wasn't all that long ago, back during the Cold War. Sure. And it seems to be starting up again. You know, it looks like the U.S. Navy's moving its fleet out into the Pacific, and they look like they're getting ready for something, but God knows what. Hmm. Yeah, you're right. And uh, they seem to um, maneuver in such a way that they, um, well, they get interest, if I can put it that way, in different regions uh, throughout history, focus on that um, to be able to control it. And, and uh, uh, Japan and, and the Far East, as we know, has had an interest by uh, many Europeans throughout history, of course, with the uh, Jesuits being over there and also with the, uh, later the, the when the Protestants came along, the Dutch and so forth. Like if you look even at the, uh, well, the Shogun series, right, shows a little bit of this. Uh, and the, the interest of how they tried to manipulate uh, the Japanese at the time. The, the Shogun uh, book was actually a composition of, of several different stories from different periods of Japanese history, which he just put together rather brilliantly and made it a fascinating novel. But when you get into the same stuff, and it's not a novel, but nonfiction, and you find that people are lying here, lying there, they're lying everywhere, they're stealing money, they're walking off with uh, 600 million here and over there. TV Song, the, the brother of Madame Chiang Kai-shek, once got the White House to give him the money for a whole shipload of tanks to be shipped to China during World War II. And actually, he just pocketed it. There was no ship. There were no tanks. And he made the whole thing up. 
he was brilliant at this. And his everybody in the family was brilliant at this, except for the sister, the one of the three sisters who married Dr. Sun Yat-sen. She was a romantic and therefore, I guess you could say, a bit naive. She believed things. Uh, the others didn't. They were all just a um, pretty villainous bunch. <laughs> when Madame Chang died back uh, just a couple of years ago. Yeah, 2003, yeah? Yeah. The uh, Taiwan Times wrote an obituary of her in which she called, they called her the, the most evil woman of the 20th century. <laughs> and their last line was, goodbye and good riddance. <laughs> now, you never expect that from Taiwan, which she had been first lady of, and before that first lady of China, married to uh, that gangrenous monster, Chiang Kai-shek. Um, but that's, it's fun to do, you know, you discover things about people that they're desperate to hide. And how, how did, how, how do you and Peggy come over some of the material? What are you looking at old archives, uh, reporting newspapers and such, or, or where do you go to dig some of this stuff up? Well, we, for one thing, Peggy reads a great deal. She reads in English and in French and so forth. And she connects things. She makes these intuitive connections. That's how I can all describe them. It's mm -hmm. intuitive. Um, somehow or another, you read something somewhere or you see something somewhere and a connection occurs to you that hasn't occurred to anybody else. And you're a little bit astonished. So you look into it and See if you can't find out more about it. And then, by golly, you do. Once you've got the eye on the target, you begin to find things left and right that you've ignored before. And um, it's really wonderful because it gets exciting. And you get into cases where you understand why somebody was murdered and how they were murdered. Um, like like the King of Siam, uh, the young King of Siam at the end of World War II, uh, was wrestling around with his brother, the current king, and um, a pistol that he kept under his pillow went off, and it killed the young king. Well, they blamed it on the the guard at the door, but the problem was that the bullet that hit the king's head wasn't the same caliber as the pistol that was carried by the guard at the door. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is the kind of thing that switches you on, you know? Sure. Now, in a few minutes here, I want to begin to discuss uh, Yamashita's goal here, uh, getting to the main topic, I guess, of, of uh, today's program here. But would, would you say that, the, I mean, as we know, Sterling, people inherently have a, uh, a reaction to, I guess, conspiracies and, and, and hidden history and things that are uh, inconsistent if we begin to examine them uh, from a historical perspective. Is that the kind of world, I guess you would say, that you, you and your wife Peggy de is dealing in within the you know hidden things and, and inconsistencies and even uh, conspiracies to that extent? Or would you classify it, put it in a different category? I'd, I'd put it in a slightly different category. We're we're not interested in conspiracy per se because it's it's so commonplace. Um, you know, there's collusion going on all over the place. Um, what we're looking for is a kind of conspiracy or collusion that is is so bizarre that it just knocks you out of your saddle. Um, and that's what gets us all worked up and excited. And we start finding out, is this true? This can't possibly be true. So we take a negative approach. And we see what survives the negative approach. Does it really turn out to be true? Like, could the mother of Emperor Hirohito really be a Christian in a Shinto country? 
I can't believe that that's true. But what Peggy found out is that when wealthy people in Japan want to raise a daughter, they don't want to send them to the normal um, raise your rich daughter in our private prep school. They want them privately educated. And so they send them out to the countryside and the countryside out at the foot of Mount Fuji is a place where the, the uh, uh, well, you would say the Christians have gone and settled and tried to stay out of everybody's way. Christians have gone to, uh, to Japan from time to time over the centuries. But they usually get, in, get, get themselves killed and crucified because there's usually a reaction to them. Hmm. The Quakers, you see, don't have churches and they don't sit in pews and sing hymns. So they don't attract attention to themselves at all. And so the Quakers that went to Japan all went out and lived in the countryside at the foot of Mount Fuji and and uh, one of the things they did while they were raising um, their crops was to educate uh, the children of very wealthy people who were anxious that their children get a very modern education instead of an adequated one. And in the case of, of uh, Hirohito, Hito's mother, she was just one of many girls who went out to the countryside and came back highly educated, but also a Christian. So this, this astounded us. Um, and it also astounded us that when she died, they had to have two ceremonies, one up front for the public, um, and, and the other one out back for the Quakers. At, at the Imperial Palace in Tokyo. So these things are so bizarre and off the wall. They, they, they absolutely fascinate us. Mm -hmm. um, she went to, to Sidwell Friends School, the Quaker School in Washington, D.C., which is one of the best private schools in Washington. Um, The, the wife of her second son also went to Sidwell Friends Quaker School. So he must be Quaker too. In fact, when he had his funeral, he had his private funeral out back and his public funeral out front. The front one was um, Shinto and the back one was Quaker. That's the kind of thing that we're looking for. We're not looking for a sort of sordid um, conspiracies. We, we've run into a few. For example, uh, we, we did a book called Dragon Lady. We were asked to do this book, uh, as we have been on, on several occasions. Um, this is about the last Empress of China. And the reason we were asked to do it is because she was supposed to be a, a sex monster psychopath who murdered any number of lovers and enemies and so forth and so on. Just, you know, um, imagine everything you can visualize about uh, ancient Chinese empresses and how sinister they must have been, especially if they were sex crazed. So. Here is one who was already identified that way in all the books that had been written about that period of time, the last, the last empress of, of the Manchu dynasty, which was all around, you know, um, the turn of the century, 2000. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, well, it, it turned out she wasn't any of that stuff. She was a nice girl. <laughs> we thought we were going to be writing a book about a, a really sordid vamp. 
and it turned out that uh, she was too nice to do any anything like that. She liked little, you know, Chihuahua dogs, and um, she didn't do the evil things she was supposed to have done. They were all taken out of the history books by a British guy who had run away from home because he was really weird. He'd, he'd been to Cambridge, and he was a, a, a genius at linguistics, so he spoke something like 12 languages, including Mongol. But he's the one who either wrote or co-authored all the books, all the first books on the Dowager Empress and the Manchu dynasty in its last years before it folded and was replaced by warlords. And it's all lies. It's just all lies. The guy uh, was a nutbag. Uh, and he was George Morrison's leg man. So George Morrison didn't, couldn't be bothered to study Chinese. He didn't speak a word of Chinese. Um, and so he couldn't report stories himself. He had to go on rumors. So this guy is a guy, Sir Edmund Backhouse. He, he inherited the barony. Um, <clears throat> Edmund Backhouse is the one that made up all these stories about the Dowager Empress being a sex fiend and a, a, a poisoner and all the other bad things you can think of that girls can get up to. And none of it is true. And yet every... I'm, I may be sticking my neck out a bit here, but I'll say that every single book that has been written about her and her period simply repeats these same lies over and over and over again because they're all copying Edmund Backhouse. And just like George Morrison was using Edmund Backhouse's material, everybody else was believing it. Professors are writing books in which they say the same thing. Well, that's the problem when uh, you go to the same reference material over and over again. So I think I suspect this is th something that's happening around the world uh, quite more often than we uh, realize, Sterling, that the roles of the praised heroes and the demonized villains actually are uh, reversed, right? I really believe you're right. Um, I think the, the, there's a tremendous amount of lying in the world. And the lying, of course, is is there to enhance either your power or your prestige or um, or your financial resources, deep in your pockets. But um, unless you're aware that you're probably being lied to, <laughs> you you get taken in by this. And if it's cleverly enough done you get completely turned around so that your whole point of view, like look at the United States right now, okay? You've got a country there that is absolutely convinced that Muslims are terrorists. All Muslims are terrorists. Even Muslims that are a different kind of Muslim are terrorists. And the number of Americans that actually believe this, whether they come right out and admit it or not, is astounding, astounding. Now, who was it last time around? Well, I can remember back during World War II when I was a kid, all Japanese had bad eyesight and crooked legs and they couldn't fly. You know, they, they just nonsense put about. Now, um, obviously, this is information then that goes against uh, the mainstream, something we, we appreciate and, and enjoy to highlight for that reason alone, so that people can get uh, hopefully closer to the truth by examining both sides of the story, as it were. And, and before we go even too far now into the first hour, I do want to try to get into the story about Yamashita's goal. You, you have written two, bo two books relating to this subject, the uh, Yamoto Dynasty, the Secret History of Japan's Imperial Family, uh, released in 2000, and then of course the uh, Gold Warriors, America's Secret Recovery of Yamashita's Gold, published in 2003. Um, well, there's actually a third one, and that's the Marcos Dynasty, because before we could finish that book, we had to deal with 
the uh, storytelling about Marcos having hooked into a whole lot of uh, Yamashita's gold, yeah. which, which turned out to be true. Uh, and that's what got us worked up enough to look at the Japanese side of the story in Yamato dynasty to see if the Japanese said, how could they possibly steal so much gold, so much silver, so much of so many things and move it to the Philippines or Indonesia or even get it get it back to Japan before the United States got into the war because back back in those days they could move it through Korea, Manchuria and Korea, which they had already seized. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> and then when the Americans finally got their um, their their submarine uh, torpedoes working correctly so that they, they could actually hit the target. They managed to block sh further shipping north to Japan. So uh, gold, silver, uh, huge Buddhas, you know, seven ton Buddhas, things like that, uh, solid gold had to be moved to the Philippines instead and had to be hidden there. But the Japanese had this wild idea that they could somehow negotiate um, a truce in the war in which eventually the, their peace settlement would grant the Philippines to Japan. And so they figured they could come back and get the gold whenever they wanted to. Now, I want to get into this in detail, what happened. We should detail a bit about the background of uh, Yamashita as well. But before we do that, before I forget, you said earlier as well that you were asked uh, to write the books. By, by who? Your publisher or, or other other folks here? Um, right after the Song Dynasty was uh, a big success. Well, it, it, it was not only a bestseller, but it was um, a Book of the Month Club main selection. And um, Paul Newman and George Roy Hill, the guys who did Butch Cassidy and The Sting, uh, they bought the option to make a film of it. And so the thing was really rolling. And so at that point, um, Harper and Rowe asked me uh, if Peggy and I could could do um, the same sort of book as we had done on the songs, but do it on the Marcoses, since at that very point, uh, the Marcoses were you know, facing the mobs in the streets. They hadn't been kidnapped by the U.S. yet. But um, it was getting hot. And so we we agreed and we started working on the book. But it was only after they kidnapped Marcos and, and got him to Hawaii that uh, more and more, more stuff came out about Yamashita's gold and what were they going to live on. And he was trying to borrow money from some alleged friends of his. But uh, the story does turn out to be true. I mean, it, it was quite obvious, even at that time, that it was true that there was gold stolen in such vast quantities by the Japanese. It's just that in the West, we're told, oh, there's only 120,000 uh, uh, kilos of, of, of gold. In, in existence um, above the ground. And that simply isn't true. That's just nonsense. Um, there's much, much more than that. The reason that uh, there is so much more is because we're not talking about what's above the ground in the West, what's been, you know, mined and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, poured into mm -hmm. various size ingots. What we're talking about is, is all of Asia. And Asia, Asia doesn't ha didn't have banks. And they, they kept their gold hidden. They kept it hidden in, in the ancestral tomb. They kept it hidden under the house. They kept it hidden all over the place. But they have been saving gold for at least three, four thousand years. I mean, we've written books about China going back uh, to the Shang Dynasty, 
which is as far back as you can go with any certainty. In fact, it was a Shang vase that Madame Chang hit gen the Generalissimo with once when she got really mad, and they're made out of bronze, so it must have hurt like hell. Um, but, you know, the, the problem is that you, you get these fixed ideas, like you do often in the West, like, um, oh, there's only 120,000 kilograms of gold above ground, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact is, they haven't done uh, an inventory of the Fed in this century, and they haven't done an inventory of Fort... Um, uh, Fort Knox. Knox. Some, some claim it's even missing, right? It's just gone. They don't have it anymore. Well, they either don't have it or they have a hell of a lot more <laughs> than, than they want to admit to. Mm -hmm. My supposition is that all this gold, let's just concentrate on, on the gold that was recovered after World War II from, uh, from the Third Reich and also the, the Japanese gold that's been recovered. Is that, sorry, but is that like a one... Uh, as one unit, or, or, or were this still in different parts of the world at the time? Uh, different parts of the world at the time. I mean, the, the, the American military was huge in Europe uh, during the war. It was very small in the Far East. They had General Stilwell and, and a couple of uh, military units with him. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, he had very, very few Americans. Um, they had to make it seem that he was more powerful and more effective than he was. Well, actually, he did defeat the Japanese finally in Burma and did things like that. So it's so no question he was a hell of a good general. But let's just consider how much gold they found in Europe when they collected it at all. Well, they found uh, in the salt mines near Salzburg in Austria great quantities of gold that had been, you know, recast by the the, the, the Deutsche Bank. I, I can't remember the German name for it. Mm -hmm. And um, in Asia, they recovered much, much more than that. Um, I would say that all in all, in Asia, they recovered somewhere in the neighborhood of three trillion in gold. Now, that's just me talking to you. You know, mm -hmm. if if I were being grilled before the Supreme Court, I'd have to admit I'm not sure. I don't have any idea, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The the amount of gold that I see coming out through my sources. And and I know a hell of a lot of people that are uh, scooping up gold in the Philippines and and bringing it out, particularly the Japanese from from the uh, from the ocean, correct? Uh, well, some of it comes from the ocean, but the the great majority of it is is taken out of of um, uh, caves and. Um, Oh, hiding places in the mountains that have mm -hmm. been built. You know, they've excavated um, tennis court sized places where they built the whole thing up with rebars and concrete, and then they filled it with gold ingots, you know, different size ingots, either biscuit bars or, or big 75 kilo bars, which take two guys to carry. And, um, they have brought out so much of this stuff already. They've had ships carrying it around all over the world, putting it in different banks, hiding it in different holes. Well, Marcos was giving an awful lot of it to the United States in return for gold bearer certificates. So the whole idea was that the U.S. wanted wanted some uh, some gold and Marcos had lots of gold and so they would 
in a sense, borrow this from him and promise him a certain uh, percentage interest rate and give him a gold bearer certificate. Well, after a while, Marcos discovered that these gold bearer certificates were counterfeit. And that, in fact, they were counterfeit by, by the um, Bureau of Engraving and Printing in Washington. <laughs> and hmm. they're, they're counterfeited in, in the way of misspelled words, um, flaws in dates, signatures that are not quite right, and stuff like that, stuff that you'd never know. And then there's, there's another form of counterfeiting they use in which they, they make it a little bit more conspicuous. And they say the reason that that's in there is because that will help us to know that this is a legitimate document you've got here. Because you're here while we're putting that in. You know it's there, we know it's there. And when we see that you have that same flaw in your document, it'll prove that it's valid. Well, that's rubbish. And so in the end, if you take a 75 kilo gold bar and you take the ingot around to your favorite, most highly respected bank, and you give it to them for safekeeping, which is a very bad idea. <laughs> give you a gold bearer certificate and you can bet your life it's got so many fleas in it that you won't realize what you're holding in your hand until you walk around the block and that's all I'm asking you to do walk around the block and go back into the same bank and ask them if they've ever seen you before and they'll tell you they don't know who you are they don't recognize you, they didn't see you today, they didn't see you yesterday, and this document you got in your hand is a counterfeit print in Hong Kong. Uh, that's happened to so many people. I mean, people people that I've checked out and I've trusted hmm. as a consequence. Mm -hmm. Well, and, I've, I've heard uh, the stories about uh, those who discovered uh, tungsten in their gold bars as well. Well, uh, tungsten's almost as valuable as platinum, okay? Mm -hmm. Because they use it to, to to put on the tips of rockets and bullets and cannon shells and so forth. Because it's one of the hardest elements there is. And it helps uh, penetrate the armor plate on, on the tank. So one of the places, one of the few places on earth where you can get tungsten in any quantity is in China. So the things that they're smuggling out of China, if they can, are opium, heroin, especially Chinese white, and tungsten, gold, and silver, and platinum. So, you know, the amazing thing is that this bank you walked into, say you went into Citibank, gave them this document, uh, gave them this gold, and they gave you the document. You walk around the block, go back in there, and they won't know who you are. Hmm. Because they want to take the gold from you, and they never want to give you back the real thing, correct? That's correct. They don't want you to ever see that gold again. And and here's here's a true story. Okay, um, the guy who tortured General Yamashita's driver, or is said to have tortured him, he may have bribed him instead, into admitting that he knew where 12 different vaults were in northern Luzon. And he could indeed take them to each of these places, which he'd taken the general to, so that he could sign off on each vault. And, uh, you know, just as a courtesy to the emperor, go back and say, I signed off on each of these personally. Um, what happened is that the giving of these fake notes to people in exchange for gold got to be so commonplace that now uh, people are scared to go looking for gold in, in the Philippines anymore. Uh, this this was a guy who could take you around, take you to the vault, show you how to get into the vault, and once you were inside, you found you were 
in a tennis court sized place that was just uh, two meters deep in, in 75 ingot, uh, uh, kilo gold ingots. Mm -hmm. um, then this stuff is taken out. It's put in ships usually because it's so heavy rather than aircraft. You can only carry several uh, bars on, on an aircraft. But they would take this out of Subic Bay and bring it either back to the United States or they'd take it down to Australia where they would convert gold. Gold can't be put on the gold market unless it's got a proper paper trail. And you've got to know where the gold came from, uh, who mined it, um, because where it came from will determine exactly what minerals are included in the gold. So to be, before anybody will believe that you're dealing in honest gold, let's call it, they have to be able to look at the paper trail and they have to be able to um, run it through mineral tests so that they can find out if it has the right minerals to prove that it was taken out of the ground in Java or in Sumatra or in Burma or in Thailand or wherever. Okay. It, it's got a fingerprint in the mineral content. And all of this stuff has got to be done before you can put it on the London gold market. So you have to be pretty careful or you're going to end up with 13 years in prison, you know, because you walk in and you've got documents that turn out to be counterfeit. And you've got, say, you know, um, cookie sized bars or cracker sized bars of gold. And they have the wrong kind of fingerprint to go with the paperwork and you'll end up in prison. Even if you bought it in good faith? It doesn't matter. There's no way you can prove the good faith. The thing is, you have hmm. governments who are interested in repapering gold and in sponsoring the re-smelting. Yeah, that's basically it. You, you, you have governments that want your gold, whether it's your gold or not your gold, or whether you're, it's, it's stolen or whatever it is. What they want is they want to get the gold from you and then they want to make it disappear. Ah, I remembered what I was in the process of telling you before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the guy who allegedly tortured Yamashita's driver uh, ended up with a, a single account at Citibank in New York with 50 million in, in gold. Now we checked this out by going and looking at his financial documents that were registered at the state government in Albany. And we found the documents we found. He did indeed have the um, those accounts with those numbers on them at Citibank. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then the attorneys that were acting for our associates got a hold of the CEO of Citibank and a room full of attorneys and representing him. And they tried to persuade him that he had to give this uh, 50 million in, in gold back to the widow. And he wouldn't do it. He said, we don't have any accounts. This guy, Santa Romana, doesn't have an account in our bank and so forth and so on. So he threw them out. His attorneys told them to leave. They left. And a short while later, the $50 million in gold was moved from Citibank, New York, to City Trust in Nassau in the Bahamas. The reason for that is to get it offshore so nobody can run a trace on it because there are all these other countries that will be happy to have that gold on their soil. And if they don't have to prove anything, if they don't have to chase any paper and it's all off the books. Don't forget to mention all these documents are on the CDs. Yeah, we, when, when we finished writing Gold Warriors, 
we realized that a lot of people were not going to believe it. They're just going to say, this is absurd. How can you have that much gold in, in, on this planet? Well, um, we decided to produce a bunch of CDs that would have digital copies of as many of our documents as we could pack on to them. So we ended up producing three CDs and essentially um, um, you can see on these documents photographs of the people involved. You can see photographs of the letters that convey this information. All the people that were smuggling with, with Marcos, they, they've all signed off on these things. Uh, Marcos's signature, of course, is there. The city bank records are there, mm -hmm. all of this stuff. And um, it's it actually um, got affirmed for us in, in an amazing way. There is an attorney in Los Angeles who was approached by a guy named Robert, Roger Roxas, who was um, just for his fun of it, he, he went looking for gold and he happened to find a tunnel that went underneath the hospital in Bangyo, the resort city in, up in the mountains north of Manila. Mm -hmm. And while he was getting all his buddies to help him um, clear the, the tunnel out, you know, open up the mouth and then uh, let it air out for several weeks to get rid of the, um, the toxic smell. They went in and they're exploring this tunnel when they discover that they're on a slab of concrete that's two meters wide by two meters wide. And it's almost one meter thick in its top piece. So they shattered this thing. They knew something had to be hidden down there. And to cut a long story short, they found a solid gold Buddha from Burma. that was sitting down there, weighing one ton, exactly one ton. Hmm. So they, they got um, the hoisting gear that you usually use with an A-frame. And they hauled this thing out, took them days to get it out of the pit, and then days to drag it into this truck. Took it back to his house. They took it with all every everybody he had, hauled it back and tucked it beside the bed in the bedroom, between the bed and the wall. That night, Marcos's uncle and General Ver, the, uh, the chief torturer from Malacanang Palace, who's, you know, his signature is pulling your eyeballs out. Um, they showed up with a gang of guys and they stole the Buddha from Roger Roxas. So Roger then got the daylights beaten out of him and, you know, was tortured. He was put in prison for a while. But when he finally got out, friends of his in the United States got this California attorney to take on his case pro bono. And what he did was he took our book, The Marcos Dynasty, and he had detectives track down all of our sources that we'd listed at the back of the book. And he took um, uh, depositions video depositions and, and mic, mic definitions from all of them. And he presented it as, as a large part of his evidence to a U.S. court in Honolulu, and he won the case. Hmm. Well, and he won the largest civil award ever given by a U.S. court to that date. Hmm. So, you know, that made us feel pretty comfortable because that meant well, court judges the books straight, you know, we're not. The entire court suit is on the CDs. Oh, yeah, the, the entire court suit is on the CDs. 
That's right. I, I want to give you opportunity, Sterling, to uh, to mention that as well as we kind of begin to run things up here for the first hour. We're, we're kind of deep into it right now. But before we go there, I want to you know mention your website and stuff like that as well. But um, we might have jump, jumped the gun, so to speak, on, on a few of the topics. So why don't we, in the last few minutes here of the first hour, just give us an overview. Let's go just zoom, zoom out a little bit and, and go back. And let's just talk a little bit more about some of the main people involved. Uh, I know this is a huge topic and we're going to kind of carry on in the whole next hour to talk about this. But just a brief overview in a way to, to kind of summarize it for a little bit for some people who are not aware of this. Uh, what what Where the gold came from, uh, basically how the Japanese got their hands on this. Was this during many years or did all of this happen during... Uh, World War Two, and maybe you can just break down, you know, who uh, Yamashita was as well for us. Well, we always think in terms of World War One and World War Two, but uh, the Japanese Chinese War actually started before that in 1895. And at that point, what happened was um, Japan invaded Korea and seized the country and turned it into a colony, looted it from one end to the other. And this is an ancient, ancient culture, what is now both North and South Korea. As soon as they'd finished doing that, they turned around and they they um, invaded Manchuria, which doesn't have much in the way of gold and other things like that, but has uh, wonderful natural resources. So they were able to turn it into the biggest opium production center in, in East Asia while they were occupying it. By this point, it was in the early 1920s. And um, I'm, I'm correct, 1930s. And they decided it was time to move down into China. They had originally thought of invading Siberia. <coughs> Pardon me. But um, they decided on, on heading south instead, since the Russians were uh, a lot tougher than they were. Hmm. Um, they, they headed south, they got down to the Great Wall, and they were just on the outskirts of, of Peking. Um, when we get around to the late 1930s, and in 1937, um, this is when the looting really began because the Japanese army came down into China, uh, down nearly as far as the Yangtze River, which is in the middle, and was just looting everything and shipping it all back uh, through Manchuria and Korea, and then across the strait into uh, Japan. This is how the whole thing began, and it got the emperor nervous because he was concerned that uh, his troops, his officers, were going to um, lighten the load on its way back, that they were going to help themselves to as much of their treasure that they were stealing as they would like. And so he called in his eldest brother, um, and asked him to please take charge of a new agency they were starting, which was going to be called Golden Lily. Golden Lily uh, being in Japanese the, the name of one of his haiku poems. Um, this was carried out. They, they started an enormous uh, enterprise, like another CIA. But this was charged with taking possession of all the imperial, what they call the imperial treasure that could be stolen from these places they were conquering, not just ordinary treasure. This, this would be everything including, um, oh, fabulous scrolls, you know, stuff that if, if you auctioned it off in New, in New York or London, you know, you'd get 30, 40 million for it. And this stuff was all sent back by train through Korea and then by ship over to Japan. And it was tucked away 
in various uh, places that were controlled by the emperor, uh, including the basements at uh, the imperial palace. And a huge cavern up near where they had the Olympics in Japan a couple of years ago. Um, they moved then in 1937 down and seized Shanghai completely and looted it totally from end to end. Then they moved over to Nanjing and the head was since called the Rape of Nanjing where uh, Chiang Kai-shek politely took his army out of the city before the Japanese arrived and left the civilians all there to get murdered. <laughs> and almost all of them were murdered. There were a bunch of uh, Europeans who were there, missionaries, diplomats. In fact, there was even uh, a Nazi ambassador who was there, who was a very nice guy, and he was defending these these poor people who were getting their heads lopped off. There was gang rape going on in every street. Uh, there were groups of people having, groups of Japanese officers having competitions to see who could decapitate the most Chinese in the course of one day. Um, so it was at this point that things really got serious because things were really getting nasty, okay? It was turning into a really nasty war. And the Chinese army wasn't anywhere around to, to defend anybody, so everybody just got looted. All the collections, all the beautiful collections in Nanjing, which, which was at, at one time the capital of China, all these things were looted. All the libraries were looted. And in the course of all of this, the princes helped themselves. There were at least eight or ten princes who were in Nanjing at that time. Uh, they all confessed later on to having horrific nightmares of the atrocities that they observed, uh, which was pretty persuasive. And this is when the thing then spread to be something covering all of East Asia because uh, the next stop on the Japanese um, agenda was um, what we now call North Vietnam. They, they took over Hanoi uh, thanks to um, the French uh, saying, we'd rather you didn't destroy it, just you can have it. And um, uh, at that point, they jumped off from there to Thailand, which also gave in without a struggle. And then they came across into Burma, uh, where I was at the time, although I was just a kid. Um, I, I have very, very vivid memories of, of, uh, of the Japanese invasion, of getting strafed and bombed. And um, Then they proceeded down the Malay Peninsula, taking Singapore, and then taking all of Indonesia. Now, everywhere they went, you need to know that they not only stole the gold and the diamonds and, and whenever they found somebody with jewelry of any kind, they took, they took the stones out of the, out of the jewelry, put the jewelry in one oil drum and put the stones in another oil drum so that they had the stuff ready to go by ship back to Japan. And one of the things that um, naturally galled me is that uh, my father had a hospital on the border of China and uh, we had, the Flying Tigers had an air base across the valley on the other side of the river on the China side. And the Japanese were flying up from Hanoi and bombing and strafing the Flying Tiger base. And every time they did that, they would then save some bombs and, you know, some belts of ammunition and come over and bomb and strafe our hospital. Well, we managed to get out of the place about three days before the Japanese army arrived. But we couldn't take our dogs with us. We had two Irish Terriers 
And so we left them with some people we trusted dearly who were going to pretend they were their dogs. When the Japanese got there, they tracked them down, took the dogs, took everybody in the village, gathered them around a big banyan tree in front of the hospital, roped the dogs up by their hind legs in the tree and hacked them apart with their sabers and said, this is what's going to happen to you if you do anything we don't like. And this is what's going to happen to the sea graves if they should show up. Hmm. Um, it galled me a bit. And um, I, I think uh, I, I think I like the Japanese essentially in, in a, how shall I say, in a cultural way. I like them very much. I like their music. I like, you know, their art, their gardens and everything else. But boy, can they be vicious. Their, their army was just farm boys being run around by a bunch of princes and a bunch of essentially uh, gangsters. So, you know, Yakuza, right. um, the bad, the worst of the bad quarter. And uh, everybody was looting and Morrison joined in. So she, uh, she had this knack for discovering uh, stuff that was just astounding. And uh, it worked better and better, and we got um, a lot of, of um, pleasure out of collaborating on the text as well. So she began writing uh, chapters for the different books, and it ended up being a good collaboration. We've written about 10 or 11 books now, nonfiction. And um, these are all biographies, or, or they're basically investigative books mostly uh, investigating the bad behavior of some of the richest uh, and most powerful families in Asia, um, like Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek's wife's family and um, the Japanese imperial family, where they've often written about the men in the family, but nobody's ever written about the women before. Hmm. So we did a book on... Um, the Japanese imperial family in which both the women and the men uh, are covered. And we discovered in the course of this, Peggy discovered, that uh, Hirohito's mother was a Christian. She was a, a Quaker. And so for that matter, were several of her sons. I don't know about Hirohito for sure. But when they had their various funerals, they had to have one public funeral that was um, Shinto and another private funeral for the family, which was uh, Christian. So this is the kind of thing that she would come up with as she went to work on various books. So it, it turned out to be uh, just a, a really hell of a good collaboration for us. Plus she has tremendous energy. In any case, we've, we've concentrated on, on the really evil deeds, the, uh, the underworld uh, side of these extremely famous and um, I won't say notorious because we're talking about Madame Chiang Kai-shek and she was considered voted in the United States as uh, one of the 10 greatest women on earth, one of the 10 most admired. So... <laughs> How did they get away with with this? Well, my my pleasure, really. Excellent. Now, why don't we begin tell you know talking a little bit about yourself here in the beginning? You you have a long career writing many books yourself with uh, your wife, of course, Peggy, who unfortunately couldn't join us here today. But just tell us a little bit about um, how how you two got together, started writing, and and a little bit later here we're going to get into some of the uh, specifically some of the topics, of course. But just give us a little primer here, if you will. Well, uh, both of us started out um, born in, in the United States, um, but um, my family had been living for a couple of hundred years uh, as missionaries, medical missionaries out in Burma. So uh, the U.S. was always uh, a little bit strange and alien to me. I, I joined uh, 
Time Life Books, where I met Peggy. I was uh, a senior writer there, and she was um, a senior picture editor and researcher. So we began working on books together and did quite a few, uh, 20 some, um, and eventually um, decided to get married. So it worked out well in the sense that um, uh, she working as uh, essentially researcher and editor in the beginning, uh, and me as a writer, um, made a good team. And especially when I discovered that she was able to uh, find out things when she went out on a research trip that nobody else could. There, there uh, was a famous episode in the Boxer Rebellion in China back in 1900, where the British correspondent, the most famous correspondent there, was uh, George Morrison from Australia. And um, when he died, he left his papers to the Mitchell Library in Sydney. Peggy went down there to have a look through his papers and discovered that um, he had written two versions of the Boxer Rebellion, one for the British paper where he wanted to make the Brits look good. And the other was a private diary that apparently nobody else had bothered to read very thoroughly. Peggy read through it and found that it denied, it said the opposite of what he had been saying in the newspaper. <laughs> So it turns out that uh, he was pocketing things while they were busy looting, uh, while the allied forces were busy uh, liberating the legation. So getting interviewed by just about everybody, but the book wasn't in the bookstores yet. It had all happened so fast. Hmm. In any case, the book made me famous, if not rich. And so that got me... Um, an invitation to do a book about Madame Chiang Kai-shek's family called uh, The Song Dynasty. And uh, Peggy helped me a great deal on that because she has a very clear eye for editing as well as for research. And the book became a bestseller all over the United States. And Madame Chiang did something very stupid. As you know, you can tell I, I don't have a very high opinion, didn't have a very high opinion of her. Mm. Um, but she got a hold of her, her cohort in Taiwan and, and had them drum up three full page ads, one for the New York Times, one for the Washington Post and one for the LA Times. And this cost her 86000 per page. So it was a pretty good promotion for me. And the next day, the book was a bestseller. <laughs> it was denouncing me for deliberately misinterpreting Chinese history when all I was doing was telling the truth behind her family. There's fact, uh, no such thing as bad publicity then, I guess, huh? Yeah, good publicity. <laughs> yep. Her name wasn't even... Um, uh, Song, the name of the family was originally Han. Hmm. And when her father w ran away from home and went off to the United States, the Americans had hardly ever seen at that time in the late 1900s, uh, had they ever seen a Chinese, unless you were on the West Coast where they were building the railways. But they misunderstood his name and, and used it backwards. So his, his name Han was forgotten completely. That's his family name. And instead they called him by what would be for us our first name. So he became Charlie Sung. Uh, wasn't his name at all. <laughs> so she became Mei Ling Sung. And her sisters, the other Sung, three Sung sisters who are so famous, um, also uh, were, were called, uh, they spent an awful lot of money on publicity and creating false images of themselves while they were busy uh, siphoning off, looting, or extorting millions, in fact, billions of dollars. So it's been great fun for us. We've had a bunch of death threats and 
we hid out for a year out the west coast of, of Canada and, uh, you know, just disappeared off the face of the earth for a while and kept a, a shotgun nearby. Hmm. Uh, and the guys who came looking to kill me or us uh, couldn't find us. So they went down to San Francisco and they murdered a Chinese journalist named Henry Liu. But, uh, you know, this is, is fun in a sense for me. It's, it's exciting. It make, it's much more exciting than sitting in a, in a newspaper. I used to work for the Washington Post and there would be some exciting assignments or a, a chance to cover for somebody else at the White House. But uh, it just isn't the same thing because you basically do what you're told. Whereas if you're a freelance writer, um, you you have to um, you have to do it yourself. Indeed, and and uh, we're going to get into some of the reasons here, uh, of course, why uh, someone might want to go after uh, you and some of the details of this is things that is contained within your work within the books. And you have, well, I mean, you, your your whole focus, as far as I have understand it, your your lineup, what you have in terms of uh, books is focused on on the Far East. Uh, primarily, you have one, I think, that is about uh, uh, the uh, Yellow Rain, basically, on, you know, Soviet uh, developed, uh, distributed bio biochemical weapon. But majority is, is about Japan, the Far East, the Philippines that we'll get into uh, later. Was this now then a... a a choice, or was it just that it happened to be in this area where there was a lot of undiscovered um, uh, material, I guess, uh, Sterling? just happened that way. Um, in the case of uh, Yellow Rain, that was actually primarily about uh, Laos, because at that time uh, the U.S. was pulling out of its secret war in Laos, but there were still um, a lot of collusion going on. Uh, against the uh, communist Patet Lao and uh, the Hmong people who were being um, on the U.S. side at that point uh, were a lot of them were dying of internal bleeding, massive hemorrhaging and so forth and nobody could figure out what was causing it and they figured it had to be some kind of chemical weapon but they didn't know what so I got intrigued in this because I like Laos and my, my family have been in Burma for a couple of hundred years as missionaries, medical missionaries. So I, I have an affection for the Laotian people and wanted to find out what the poison was. So I went out to Laos and had a look around, interviewed a lot of Laotians, talked to some American doctors who were specialists in severe burns and other damage to the skin and internal organs. And eventually I worked my way through all the books, all the encyclopedias of poisons until I came to the same group that penicillin belongs to, uh, you know, uh, uh, a fungus, a fungal poison. Mm -hmm. And this was called trichothecine. In fact, I found one that so perfectly nailed on the head what was happening in Laos that I actually got it down to Trico C3. And a friend of mine who was um, a military attaché out there came back and stayed at my house over the weekend and complained to me that he had sent back so many samples from the, the uh, thatch roofs why couldn't the people out at Fort Detrick, the specialists in chemical weapons, figure out what the poison was? And he's, I, I think he concluded that they just looked at whether it was nerve agent or phosgene or something like that. So I, I called a friend of mine who was the chief forensic pathologist at the CIA, and I asked him to come over and have coffee with us. We talked it over. And I asked him if he couldn't have the people at Fort Detrick um, take this, these samples out and test them again, but this time test them for trichocephine 3. And he actually did it, and they found it all over the place. Hmm. And in fact, they found it in, in Canada, in Norway, in Holland, and so forth. Hmm. 
So that, that gave me um, a whopping big thing to be interviewed about. <laughs> I found my 